All right, guys, we're going to take a look at the endocrine system. So, guys, when we look at the endocrine system, it's going to involve a special set of glands. But remember, when we talked way back at skin, um, there's different types of glands that are present in our body. Excrine glands are the ones that secrete their products through ducts straight onto like a surface or a body cavity. These are known as like sudoriferous glands and sebaceous glands, both of which are found in your skin. One produces sweat, the other produces oil. And then your digestive glands, because they're secreting their digestive enzymes into a cavity. The endocrine system, though, is going to focus in on the endocrine glands. These glands are unique because they secrete their products, which are known as hormones, into the extracellular matrix. They don't use any ducts. And then a lot of times those hormones or those products are going to then enter into the bloodstream. When they enter the bloodstream, they're going to travel to a far off site and that's where they're going to have their effect. Okay, so the endocrine system is unique because of these endocrine glands. So when we look at the endocrine system, it is going to consist of the endocrine glands plus endocrine tissue because sometimes it's not just a gland, it's a set of tissue inside of a particular organ. That organ has a normally a different job in a different body system, but a piece of it helps with the endocrine system. And we can see these here. Endocrine glands are things like the pituitary gland, the thyroid, the parathyroid, the penile, and the adrenal. On the other hand, there's endocrine tissue in your hypothalamus, which is in the brain, the thymus, pancreas, ovaries and testes, kidneys, the placenta, the stomach, the small intestines, and the list can go on. We see that a lot of the different organs will have tissue present. They do secrete some sort of hormone. Now guys, even though the blood is what delivers these products, these hormones that are released by these cells, not every cell is gonna actually respond. So even though blood is gonna go to every cell in the body, potentially delivering good things to them, not all cells will respond to the hormone because there's only gonna be target cells. Those target cells have a special receptor for that hormone. So you can only receive the hormone or the message if you have the receptor. Think about your cell phone. If you don't have any reception, you're not gonna receive any messages. Same thing here. If we don't have the receptor, we're not gonna receive the message that the hormone is sending. So as if you take a look here, this is showing you a lot of the endocrine glands or tissues. You can see that they've blown up or opened up an area of the brain and showed you the penile gland. We also see the pituitary gland. And then the hypothalamus is also part of that. We then see the thymus and thyroid are located here in the neck and kind of chest area. We see the adrenal glands are the little party hats sitting on top of the kidneys. You also have the pancreas. We can see the ovaries and the testes. Now these are not all of the different ones, but this is just to show you some of the examples. So let's do a quick comparison of the nervous system and the endocrine system, since we just kind of finished talking about the nervous system. Okay, so the nervous system is gonna send messages through nerve impulses, and it's gonna be directed to one specific tissue, who that nerve is talking to. The nerves are gonna normally talk to either muscles or glands. The response is that the muscle will either contract or the gland will secrete something. That's the response that that message gets. Responses are a lot of times fast, very rapid, but they last only for a short time. On the endocrine system side though, messages are hormones, these are chemicals, and they're delivered through the bloodstream to all the tissues, but only the tissues who have the receptors are going to respond. Okay, so the effectors are potentially all body cells, but it's the ones who have the receptor. The response, based on if they receive this hormone signal, is a change in metabolic activities. The cell that responds actually changes its activities based on that message. These responses are slower because it has to travel through the blood a long distance, but they last longer in their response. All right, so again, pros and cons when we look at this. But guys, to be honest, the nervous system and the endocrine system work together in order to control everything in your body. They're the ones that help coordinate all the functions and all the other body systems in your body. They even help regulate each other, kind of like how a government is supposed to be when we talk about our government with like the Congress and 
the uh, presidential branch and the Supreme Court, they're all supposed to keep each other with checks and balances so one doesn't get more power over the others. The same thing here, the nervous system helps keep the endocrine system in check and the endocrine system helps keep the nervous system in check. So the nervous system can stimulate or inhibit the release of certain hormones, but certain hormones can also stimulate or inhibit nerve impulses. So they're going to help keep each other um, accountable, keep each other in control. So let's talk about what hormones are. Hormones, guys, are mediator molecules. They have different effects in the cell based on the environment of that cell and what kind of receptor that cell has. Now, sometimes the hormone can work locally or it can go to a distant place in the body. Autocrine hormones are the ones who work locally. They're secreted and then they bind directly to the same cell. That's what auto means is self. So in this case, you can see that this particular cell released the hormone the hormone attached to the receptor on the same cell. This is known as an autocrine hormone. Paracrine hormones are also local hormones, but they sec they're secreted into the interstitial fluid and they are gonna act on nearby cells, okay? So in this case, we have a cell that released the hormone. The hormone travels within the same vicinity, the local area, but it's going to target a nearby cell. The last one are these endocrine hormones. Endocrine hormones are the ones that are going to travel the long distance. They enter the interstitial fluid, they're going to enter the bloodstream, and they're going to travel to a, a distant target cell that has the receptor. And we can see that here, the endocrine cell is going to release the hormone. The hormone enters the blood, traveling the distance until it gets to that distant tissue that has the receptor present. Hormones directly regulate our internal environment, our homeostasis. They're going to help with managing that. Some hormones also help with our metabolism, our energy balance, and also our circadian rhythms, like our biological clock. Now, circadian rhythms are also like your sleep cycle, your day-night cycle, and keeping your sleep schedule correct, but also biological clock in the sense of like women only have a limited time in order to reproduce before they enter menopause. That's determined by the hormones. Hormones also help regulate smooth muscle and cardiac muscle contractions. So we see that there's certain ones that are going to be part of the parasympathetic that help you with the rest and digest. There's others that are part of the sympathetic that are going to help with your fight or flight. We also see hormones are going to help you regulate different gland secretions as well as certain immune responses. Hormones are involved in the integration of growth and development. So a lot of times the hormone levels as they shift and change in the body are going to trigger growth and development. Hormones are also involved in maintaining homeostasis during emergency situations. So even in that fight or flight situation, we see that hormones are gonna play a very critical role in helping for your survival, but also helping you maintain as much homeostasis as possible. Hormones are also necessary for the basic process of reproduction. A lot of times people who have fertility issues, it's a hormone problem, okay? The hormones are not at the levels they should be or they're not going through their cycles like they should be. And so we see that the production of egg or sperm is hindered or the production of egg and sperm is fine, but then maintaining a pregnancy can't be done due to the hormones dropping. So there's a lot of stakes riding on your hormones working correctly in order for reproduction to take place, the production of a new offspring. Now remember we talked about that not all cells are going to respond to a signal of a hormone, only the cells that have the receptors are going to respond. Now remember that these receptors are what we call integral membrane proteins. Okay, so if you recall back to looking at the plasma membrane of the cell, it has two layers. It's called the phospholipid bilayer, but there's going to be sometimes embedded proteins in those layers. Those proteins act a lot of times as a channel, okay, allowing for messages to come through that membrane, and these particular receptors are that, okay? Some of them are also nuclear proteins, and so they're going to see that you're going to see these proteins on the nuclear envelope. These receptors are constantly being synthesized and broken down. As the cell is being overstimulated, let's just say a lot of hormone is being produced and it's being stimulated a lot, it will downregulate its receptors. It doesn't need as many receptors because there's a lot of message out there. But if the messages aren't being received and there's not enough, the cell may upregulate, make more of these proteins. 
This allows them to be able to catch the signal even if it is very subtle. All right, so down regulation, up regulation is constantly happening based on what your body is going through. Do you have enough hormone or not enough hormone? Is there something else that's potentially causing a problem that's overstimulating the cell that could up regulate or down regulate? Now, the reason these receptors are all a little bit different, they're part of these membrane proteins, is that they hormones come in different kind of types, okay, chemically speaking. We see that there are the steroids. The steroids are going to be a fat soluble, a fat based type of hormone. These are things like aldosterone, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. We also have the biogenic amines. The biogenic amines, this is like T3, T4. We also see epinephrine, norepinephrine, histamine, serotonin, and melatonin fall into this group. We have another set of protein and peptides. These are going to be things like releasing factors. So RF is a releasing factor. Inhibiting factors, oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, insulin, glucagon, parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, GI hormones, erythropoietin. If you notice, a lot of the hormones fall into this protein or peptide group. And then we have the exonoids. These are going to be local hormones that get released a lot of times due to damaged cells. These are things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes, and the whole point there is they're going to act as a chemical messenger to draw in white blood cells to help fight off invaders that potentially come in due to those cells being damaged. So guys, let's look at the pathway involving an intracellular hormone receptor. Now when we look at these, when the, horm the receptor is inside of the cell, these are going to be what we call lipid soluble hormones. They can pass through the plasma membrane relatively easy because of the fact of their lipid structure. They also can gain access directly into the nucleus because of this structure. Now, lipid-soluble hormones have a hard time traveling in the blood by themselves because they are a fat, and majority of your blood is made out of water in that plasma. However, once they exit the bloodstream and they get to the cell, their receptor is going to be inside the cell. So the lipid-soluble hormone will diffuse along the plasma membrane, go through the plasma membrane from high to low concentration. The membrane then binds to its receptor inside the cytoplasm. This forms the receptor hormone complex. This then is going to enter the nucleus. Now, one thing unique about these hormones is because they can gain access directly into the nucleus, they are going to directly affect gene expression. They're going to either turn genes on or turn genes off by altering the transcription phase. Whether they change it or they increase the amount of protein to be made or decrease, we see that that is going to ultimately be affecting the ribosomes on whether or not they go ahead and produce more proteins or less proteins. So when we look at the lipid soluble hormones, they are going to directly affect the cell's activities by changing or altering what we call gene expression. So water-soluble hormones can travel through the bloodstream really easily, but they have a hard time going through the membrane because of their um, composition. Because they're not lipid-soluble, they need help, and they'll use a transmembrane receptor on the actual plasma membrane. So water-soluble molecules or hormones are going to be membrane-insoluble, so they're going to bind to the receptors on the outside of the cell. This binding activates a chain reaction that takes place. Now you don't have to know every step of this chain reaction, but we do know that one triggers the next, which triggers the next. And eventually what's gonna happen is that it's going to alter how the gene is expressed, but it's gonna do it at the ribosome level, not at the nucleus level, like we saw with the lipid type of hormone. So guys, when we look at this, we do see that ultimately the activity of the cell is adjusted or changed. It's just going to go about it in different ways, whether it is what we would consider a lipid-soluble protein or hormone or a water-soluble hormone. 
So guys, the response to a certain hormone that the cell comes in contact with depends on the hormone in the specific target cell receptor. In some cases, the hormone might increase the cell's activity. In others, it might decrease the cell's activity. Another thing that affects how the cell's gonna respond is the amount of the hormone that's present. If there's not enough, it may not cause any issue for those tissues or any change. The number of receptors due to that upregulation or downregulation also will help determine how it responds. Influence by other hormones might be an issue. Some hormones can't work by themselves. They have to have other hormones present in order for them to do their job. This would be something like a permissive effect where the second hormone enhances the first hormone. The first hormone does an okay job by itself, but when the second hormone is present, it enhances it. It makes it so much better at its job. Some are considered what we call synergistic types of hormones or effects. These are where hormones have to work together. One alone is not good enough, so it requires both or maybe even three in some cases. Some hormones, however, are opposite. They have an opposite effect, and those are known as antagonistic. So antagonistic effect is when one hormone oppresses or stops the effect of the other hormone. Okay, so they have an opposite type of reaction that's present. And guys, also it depends on the target tissue. So I'm going to give you an example. Insulin is a type of hormone. But when insulin binds to the receptors on the liver cells... It causes those liver cells to start doing what we call glycogenesis. Now, glycogenesis is where it takes in extra glucose from the blood. It builds glycogen, okay, so it's going to build a bigger molecule, and it's going to store it away for a later date. That is what insulin triggers these cells to do. However, when insulin comes in contact with its receptor on adipose cells, which are fat cells, it causes those cells to do triglyceride synthesis, where they take in the fats and they create triglycerides and put them away for storage. See, the hormone wasn't different, but the effects were different because of the cell and the receptor that was present. Now guys, the secretion of hormones, how much hormone is secreted or how much hormone is present is going to be controlled by a number of things. For one, it's gonna be controlled by signals of the nervous system. Also, sometimes signals from other hormones are going to adjust or change how that hormone will work. And then chemical changes in the blood itself. If the blood has a different kind of chemistry present, it could affect certain hormones more than others. So let's talk about this main connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. This is important because we see that they are supposed to be helping each other, keep each other in check, and the hypothalamus is that link. It's the major link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. Now, why is it this link? Well, for one, it receives input from other areas of your brain. Okay, the limbic system, the cerebral cortex, the RAS, the thalamus, a lot of these areas are communicating with the hypothalamus. It also is going to receive sensory information or input from your viscera, your internal organs, as well as your visual system, your eyes. We also see that the hypothalamus is going to help regulate your autonomic nervous system, the ANS. This in turn means that it's going to have some control on some, some homeostatic areas in your body like temperature. Thirst, hunger, even sexual behavior, anger, and fear can be regulated by your hypothalamus. Cell bodies inside the hypothalamus, inside the hypothalamus are known as neurosecretory cells. These are going to actually produce some releasing factors, some RF type of hormones, as well as some inhibiting factor hormones, IFs. These can be released into the blood, and they, of course, will cause something to release something else or inhibit that. These hormones get carried to specifically the pituitary gland a lot of times, and the pituitary gland is going to be a big component of the endocrine system. So guys, when we look at the pituitary gland, this is known as also the hy hypophysis. This is going to help the hypothalamus do its job by regulating some growth, development, metabolism, and even homeostasis. The pituitary gland is located specifically at the base of the brain. 
it dangles from that base of that brain and it sits inside of the cella tercica. Now, if you'll recall, when you had to learn the bones, remember the sphenoid bone that kind of looked like a butterfly that was at the base of your skull, okay? There was a saddle-like structure that was present there. That saddle-like structure was called the cella tercica. This is where the actual pituitary hangs into that space. It offers some protection to the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary gland is attached to the hypothalamus by a stalk. This stalk is known as the infundulum. Now, if you'll also notice in this picture, the pituitary gland is split into two distinct areas. We have the front area, which is known as the anterior pituitary. This is also known as the adenohypophysis. The adenohypophysis is made out of epithelial tissue. It's the larger lobe found in the pituitary gland, and we see it produces a lot of different hormones. These hormones include human growth hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, melanocyte stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. Now, one thing to note here, guys, is you'll notice it says produce and secrete. This part of the pituitary gland actually produces hormones and releases them. When we look at the posterior pituitary, the part that's on the back, this is known as the neurohypophysis and it has mostly neural tissue present. It does not make any hormones. It doesn't synthesize or make any hormones. However, it does store two hormones. These two hormones are produced by the neurosecretory cells that are found in the hypothalamus. When they have made either oxytocin or antidiuretic hormone, they send that hormone to be stored in the posterior pituitary. When the posterior pituitary is stimulated, it will then release one or both of these types of hormones. So guys, here's just a little chart that kind of tells you um, the types of hormones that are released by the pituitary gland. It's going to show you if it, it comes from the anterior pituitary or the posterior pituitary. It also shows you the chemical type. Is it a protein, a peptide, a steroid, things like that, and also the effect. Now we're going to take a little closer look at majority of these enzymes, sorry, the majority of these hormones that are on this chart. Now we're gonna focus on the hormones first that come from the posterior pituitary. The posterior to pituitary, guys, remember, does not make any of these hormones. It doesn't synthesize them, but it does store and release two. These two hormones are made by the hypothalamus, by the, the neurosecretory cells. The hormones get sent inside axons into the posterior pituitary, and these hormones are stored there until a nerve impulse tells them to be released. When they're released, they're going to be released through exocytosis. So they're going to be inside of a vesicle or pouch. They'll fuse with the plasma membrane and then release their contents. The hormone then will diffuse to the bloodstream and be carried to its target tissue. So we see that the first one we see is the ADH. This is going to be the antidiuretic hormone. The other hormone that's produced here is going to be oxytocin. Now, oxytocin can be abbreviated as OT or OXY. There's going to be a couple of different abbreviations that could be used for oxytocin. So let's talk about oxytocin first. Now, oxytocin is going to be released during labor and delivery time. Large amounts of oxytocin are released during this time due to that stretching of the uterus and wanting to then expel or push that baby out. We also see that oxytocin gets released during lactation when the baby is feeding. This is why a lot of moms, when they first start breastfeeding, they'll talk about how they'll have cramping in their uterus with that, and that also is what helps them lose kind of that pouch a little faster than a mother who doesn't breastfeed. This is because it exercises those muscles of the uterus due to oxytocin being released. Oxytocin is going to stimulate contractions of the uterine smooth muscle. And the whole point of this idea of contractions taking place is to help with the birthing process. We also see oxytocin is going to be important in the ejection or what we call the letdown of milk in the breastfeeding process. 
Now we do have a synthetic type of oxytocin that's called Pitocin. You may have heard of an individual who goes in and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna be induced. They're gonna give me Pitocin to start my labor. This is what they're talking about. It is a synthetic form or version of oxytocin. It's used to induce labor and increase uterine contractions, and it can also help control hemorrhaging after delivery has occurred. So let's do a little flow chart here that shows what happens or how oxytocin gets released. So we first see that the uterine starts to descend or stretch because of that baby being ready to be born, or the baby is sucking or eating, okay, breastfeeding in that sense. This is going to trigger a signal in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then is going to use those neurosecretary cells to produce more oxytocin. The oxytocin, remember, is then stored in the posterior pituitary. This will trigger the posterior pituitary to release the oxytocin. Okay, so we've released it. Once we've released the oxytocin, we do see it will go talk to the uterine smooth muscle. This tells us the muscles in the uterus to contract. Okay, causing uterine contractions and causing further stretching of the uterus. Now guys, remember when we talked about feedback loops, this is an example of one of those positive feedback loops. More and more oxytocin will be released as there's more and more stretching of the uterus, cervix, and all that ready for childbirth. The problem is, is that when that stretches out more and more, more oxytocin is given off and we see it's a kind of vicious cycle until the baby is born. Another thing oxytocin does is it's going to have some target tissue in the mammary glands. This causes milk ejection or letdown, which allows for further feeding or suckling to take place. Okay, now, oxytocin, guys, is not just released by females. Men also release oxytocin. You're like, well, why? They don't have a uterus. Okay, they don't have those mammary glands for milk. The thing is, is oxytocin a lot of times is termed as what we call the love hormone. We see that when we end up having physical relationships or even just close relationships with others, oxytocin production increases. And especially during the time of sexual stimulation where we see orgasm take place, oxytocin is released in very large amounts and that's what causes those uncontrolled contractions that happen in the pelvic area. We also see that individuals who have healthy amounts of oxytocin going through their blood tend to be more generous they tend to um, be able to be more social, they um, make better eye contact, and we do find that a lot of individuals who have autism and are on the spectrum at some kind of level, their oxytocin levels are not per being released correctly. And so we see this is, could be one of the reasons why they lack that eye contact, they lack the ability to connect with other individuals. Maybe if we increase the amount of oxytocin, we might see a change in that. And that is one of the studies that they're looking at, especially for autistic adults. Another hormone that's released by the posterior pituitary is ADH, also known as the antidiuretic hormone. This hormone is going to help the kidneys be able to hold on to water when your blood pressure starts to decrease. So when osmotic pressure in the blood increases, meaning that we are getting dehydrated or we've had some sort of loss of blood, ADH is released from the posterior pituitary. Now there's osmoreceptors located in your hypothalamus that are going to stimulate the increased production of that hormone ADH. ADH then stimulates water reabsorption by the kidneys. This will decrease the volume of your urine Okay, you'll not be making near as much urine, but you're going to hold on to the extra water because you're either dehydrated or have had loss of blood. Now deficiencies in ADH, let's just say you don't make this hormone. This is known as diabetes insipidus. Now normally we think, oh well diabetes, that's with blood sugar. Not necessarily. Diabetes means that you are not producing enough of something. So diabetes insipidus is telling us that we do not have enough ADH, which is going to cause problems with bladder control and urine formation. It's the lack of the ability for the individual to concentrate their urine. So even when they're dehydrated, they will continue to go to the bathroom consistently. So let's look at this flow chart. We start with high blood pressure, or sorry, we start with high blood osmotic pressure, meaning you're dehydrated, your blood um, levels are low for some reason, your blood pressure is starting to fall, and so this is going to be what happens. 
there's going to be a trigger or a response in the hypothalamus. Osmoreceptors just detect the change in the osmotic pressure. Neurosecretory cells then produce more ADH. Now, during this time as well, the hypothalamus is going to trigger your thirst mechanism. You're going to start to have more of a cotton mouth and be thirsty, and this is to also help replace your water. These neurosecretory cells that produce the ADH send it to the posterior pituitary, where the posterior pituitary is responsible for releasing ADH into the blood. Now, ADH is going to go talk to a number of areas in the body. For one, it's going to talk to the kidney, specifically to the distal convoluted tubule. So it's kind of like the very end of the area that's going to be where urine is going to be released to the bladder and then you can't get it back. So this is going to actually cause that area, as it's getting ready and preparing the urine to leave to the bladder, it's going to increase the amount of water absorbed there. All right, so this is what decreases the urine and it also will start to concentrate the urine where it's going to have that darker color present. We also see that the posterior pituitary is going to talk to the artery walls. This is going to tell the smooth muscle there that they need to constrict, get smaller. This helps increase the blood pressure. And it's going to tell the sweat glands in the skin to decrease water loss. We don't need to lose a bunch of water even if we're sweating. Um, and sweaty and hot if we're dehydrated. So this helps shut some of that down. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and talk about the anterior pituitary. Now guys, the anterior pituitary produces a lot of hormones. It's going to produce them and release them. And this includes the luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, TSH which is thyroid stimulating, prolactin, PRL, growth hormone, GH, and the adrenocorticotropic hormone that we see with ACTH. Now, we're only going to talk about two of these right now that are only solely produced in the anterior pituitary, and they act in areas where there's not like a chain reaction that takes place. Um, the others we're going to talk about as we get to the glands that they talk to, okay, whether they talk to the ovaries or the testes, or they talk to the adrenal glands. So we're going to focus mostly on the prolactin and the growth hormone right now. So growth hormone is also known as human growth hormone. It has another name called somatotropin. This, the point of this hormone is to stimulate growth by helping again with increasing your metabolic activity and allowing those cells to get the things they need in order to do mitosis and grow that tissue. Okay. Another thing though is even when you're done growing, like say your growth plates are closed and you're done growing, growth hormone is still important in helping keep your metabolism up where it needs to be. Now growth hormone deficiency leads to pituitary dwarfism if it happens early on in development okay, or growth of that child or individual. Excessive though human growth hormone leads to what we call gigantism in children because their growth plates haven't fused let yet so it makes them grow very very tall on the other hand in adults our growth plates are closed so we can't grow taller but it can cause our bones to start to thicken and change our facial features and things like that this is known as acromegaly so let's talk about how human growth hormone gets released. So again, we have a little flow chart here. So blood, low blood glucose is detected by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases growth hormone releasing hormone. So GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone. This hormone then talks to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary releases more growth hormone. The growth hormone goes to all of your body tissues. At that point, it causes a lot of your body tissues to produce an insulin-like growth factor. Now, guys, insulin causes the blood glucose to enter into the cells. This allows the cells to have an extra energy source and be able to then grow and repair. So what we're doing here is we're creating an environment to where these cells want to take in extra glucose in order to make more ATP so they can do their job of allowing growth to take place in bone and muscle. Now, this stimulates cell growth and increases your blood glucose level, levels. On the other hand, if you have really high levels of glucose, the hypothalamus will detect this. 
it will release growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So the IH is inhibiting hormone. This is going to talk to the anterior pituitary and it's going to tell the anterior pituitary, hey, quit releasing human growth hormone. We do not need it right now. Do not release any more. Okay. So this, because these cells are not receiving that message anymore, it's less growth hormone, we see some down regulations gonna start happening, and we see that these insulin-like growth factors will decrease in the amount that they're present in the body and the blood. This ultimately leads to a decrease in blood glucose levels, okay, but it also is going to cause growth to kind of be stopped in a sense. And this is why when you think about it, when kids go through growth, or times of growth, we call it growth spurts. This is when their human growth hormone will be really high and they'll grow pretty well. Then they'll have this time where they're not growing as much and that would be where we would see the growth hormone not being released as much as, as it was during those growing phases. The other hormone that's released from the particular anterior pituitary and doesn't really talk to another endocrine type gland is prolactin. Prolactin helps initiate milk secretion, so it helps produce milk. And with oxytocin's help, it causes milk ejection, the release of the milk while the baby is feeding. Now guys, prolactin can't work alone. It has to have help. This means it has some synergistic effects. This means that prolactin needs to have the help of estrogen, progesterone, glucocorticoids, human growth hormone, thyroxin, and insulin in order for it to do its job. So excessive prolactin in females can cause galactoremia and amenorrhea. Now amenorrhea is going to be where the actual um, hormone cycle in females that create the menstrual cycle are going to be hindered or slowed down and most of the time even stopped altogether. This is why a lot of women who are breastfeeding may not have periods and then they'll talk about how then they can't get pregnant. That is an old wives tale. That is not true. You can still get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. Another thing though is if you're not breastfeeding and you're producing what looks kind of like milk, this could be due to excessive amounts of prolactin being released, released when they shouldn't be, and this is known as galactoremia, okay, or galactorema. Now, in males, when prolactin is increased, because they still produce a little bit, but not enough to produce milk and that sort of thing, excessive amounts of prolactin in males causes impotence and infertility. So let's look at the flow chart here. We have low blood progesterone levels. That's a particular type of hormone. This means that you're near delivery, so you're getting ready to deliver the baby, or we also see that it, this could be triggered by the suckling of the baby, the feeding of the baby. This is gonna be detected by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases prolactin-releasing hormone. Prolactin-releasing hormone then causes the anterior pituitary to release more prolactin. This in turn is gonna to talk to the mammary gland specifically, and they're gonna initiate more milk production. However, if you have high blood progesterone levels, you've got a higher level of progesterone levels, like during pregnancy, or let's just say that the woman gets put on birth control, increased level here of the uh, cortisol, or sorry, the progesterone, the progesterone then is going to cause the hypothalamus to detect it, and the hypothalamus will release prolactin inhibiting hormone. Prolactin inhibiting hormone goes and talks to the anterior pituitary, so less prolactin is released and made. This then means the mammary glands are not being stimulated as much, and it inhibits the milk production process. All right, so this is giving you the flow chart for prolactin. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some of the other hormones that are actually released by the anterior pituitary, but we're gonna talk about them as they relate to other endocrine glands that they talk to or they actually cause them to be stimulated and produce another hormone. So it's gonna be like an increased chain reaction of hormones that we see here. So the first thing we wanna look at is the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a butterfly-like structure um, or organ that is located just below your larynx. Your larynx is your voice box, so it's right underneath your voice box. And it has a right lobe and a left lobe, so it has two sides to it. The thyroid gland is made up of microscopic spherical sacs these sacs found in the in this gland are known as follicles. The cells found in the follicles are called follicular cells. These follicular cells are gonna actually produce two hormones, 
T3 and T4. On the other hand, the parafollicular cells, the ones outside of the follicles, will also secrete a hormone, but it's going to secrete the hormone calcitonin. So let's talk about these thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, first. We see that T3 and T4 are produced in response to thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. This is a hormone that is released from the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary releases TSH, who goes and talks to the thyroid gland, which then causes the thyroid gland to do a number of things. For one, it tells the thyroid gland to do some what we call iodide trapping. Iodine is required in order to make T3 and T4, so it's going to cause it to trap that iodide and remove it out of the blood. It then takes it and it's going to transport it to the follicular cells. This allows them then to make more T3 and T4. Once T3 and T4 are made, they're secreted into the blood. T3 and T4 are carried in the blood by a special type of carrier protein. Now this is because these guys are more fat soluble. So TBG is thyroxin binding globulin. This is a protein that's going to help carry these particular types of hormones through the blood. Now T3 stands for triiodide thyroxinine. Okay, so, or thyronine, triiodide thyronine. This is an active form. It's very small amounts of T3 that should be found in the blood because your cells should be using it. So the level in the blood should be lower because it, the cells should be using this hormone as it's released. Okay, T4 on the other hand is known as tetraiodide thyronine. This is also known as thyroxin. Okay, so another name for T4 is thyroxin. This is the less active form, and we should see a lot larger amounts of T4 in your bloodstream. Now, if you run out of T3, your body will use the T4. It's like kind of like a backup plan, but we see T3 is the more active form. Now, what do these two hormones do? T3 and T4 are very important in regulating your metabolic rate. Okay, they're helping keep your metabolism going. This is why people who have thyroid issues, they're going to see it, that their metabolism is thrown off somehow. Also, thermostasis, helping keep your body temperature regulated. We see T3 and T4 are going to help with growth and development. And activity of the nervous system is controlled by T3 and T4. So thyroid hormone levels, guys, are controlled by the amount of iodide that the body has and by two other hormones. We see TRH is thyroid releasing hormone that the hypothalamus will release when it detects there is a decrease in T3 and T4. This tells the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. This thyroid stimulating hormone then goes and talks to the thyroid itself telling it to release the extra T3 and T4 into the blood. Now, there are times when the thyroid gland does not work properly, so there are some disorders we want to talk about. Cretinism is where it's a hypothyroidism that happens during infancy, so the baby, the newborn baby, has a hard time producing T3 and T4. This leads to dwarfism and severe mental retardation. The next one we have is mexedemia. This one is a hypothyroidism, low amounts of T3, T4 again, but this is during adulthood. This is going to have some cardinal signs present like a puffy face, a slow heart rate, because it, remember it's affecting metabolism, as well as low body temperatures. This individual will be very sensitive to cold. Their hair and skin will start to dry. Muscle weakness will take place, lethargy, and weight gain. And this is seen in a hypothyroidism. Graves' disease, on the other hand, is an autoimmune disorder that is a hyperthyroidism. This is where the thyroid gland is overstimulated, producing extra T3 and T4. And this is because antibodies are acting like TSH. So the brain's not actually sending the signal to make more of T3 and T4. It's that these particular antibodies are acting like that and triggering the thyroid to work harder. 
Now, this does cause a couple of cardinal signs as well, or a couple of different signs to take place or symptoms. We have ocular edema that's going to take place, swelling in the eyes. They'll have heat intolerance. They cannot stand the heat. Sweating. Weight loss because their metabolism now is very high. They will have a high appetite but not put the weight on. Insomnia and nervousness. Because remember the nervous system is affected by T3, T4. So in the hypothyroidism, you see weight gain and you see lethargy, laziness in a sense, just means that you're tired all the time. Your nervous system is starting to kind of be depressed. On the other hand, in hyperthyroidism, your nervous system is going all over the place. It's very jittery. So we see that they will have a lot of this like pent up um, energy that they need to get out. Now, we talked about that these disorders of the thyroid or issues with whether the uh, T3 and T4 gets released is based on a number of things and one was the amount of iodide present. If we see that in your diet you don't have very much iodide, your thyroid gland is going to work hard at trapping whatever iodide is present. So it can actually cause the thyroid gland to become enlarged. This is known as a goiter. It is seen in some individuals who have Graves' disease and with dietary deficiency of iodine. You can see it here. It's a swelling of the thyroid gland. It's a type of hypertrophy where the gland is trying to work harder to do its job. So it increases in size. This is a, not a good form of hypertrophy because it puts pressure on other areas in the neck, okay? But it can also damage the thyroid to where it can no longer do its job. Tumors can also cause thyroid problems as well. So here's our flow chart for T3 and T4. We have low blood T3 and T4 levels, so our metabolic rate is low. The hypothalamus detects this. It's going to then sing a signal through using the thyroid releasing hormone. This is going to talk to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is then going to release thyroid stimulating hormone, stimulate the thyroid gland as it talks to that gland specifically. This speeds up iodide trapping and T3 and T4 production. Once the T3 and T4 are made and produced at a higher level, we see they get released into the bloodstream and they can increase the body metabolic rate. They can help regulate growth and development as well as body temperature and even they will help with the activity of the nervous system. Now remember T3 and T4 are being released by those follicular cells found in the thyroid gland but the thyroid gland also has some other cells present that are what we consider parafollicular or outside the follicles and these guys are going to be the ones that produce the hormone CT or calcitonin here. Now this isn't connective tissue here, this is calcitonin. Calcitonin is secreted when your blood calcium levels are high. You have very high calcium levels in your blood and the point of calcitonin is to lower your blood calcium levels. So we see that the body detects the high blood calcium and the thyroid gland responds directly. So if you'll notice here, there's no hypothalamus here. There's no pituitary gland here. This is the thyroid directly recognizing that there's a high level of calcium in the blood. The thyroid then releases its hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin goes and tells the osteoblasts in your bone marrow, because osteoblasts are the ones who build the bone, it's telling them to increase their activity. It stimulates the depositing of calcium into your bones. As the bones remodel and as they grow and develop, we see that this can cause them to add the calcium from the blood into the bone for storage. Just on the back side of the thyroid, we have what we call the parathyroid glands. These are going to be four very tiny glands that are located on the back side of the thyroid. And they're seen in this picture, it's very hard to see, but there's these little green dots that are present here. We have two on the right side, two on the left side. So they're located on the posterior back surface of the thyroid gland, okay? Now the parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone, or P. T H. 
So they release parathyroid hormone. Now the, this hormone is going to do the opposite of what calcitonin did. This means these hormones are antagonistic. They are opposites. They get secreted when the blood calcium level is too low. So guys, certain cells in your body rely on calcium levels in order for them to function properly. So if they get too low, we need to increase them. And you may not feel like you want to eat something that has calcium in it, so your body will take it using this hormone from your bones. So low blood calcium levels detective, detected. The parathyroid glands are going to detect it. No hypothalamus, no pituitary. The parathyroid gland is then going to release parathyroid hormone, PTH. This hormone is going to do a number of things. For one, it's going to tell the osteoclast in the bone tissue to break down the bone and release the calcium back to the blood. Okay, so osteoblasts were building bone, osteoclasts are tearing the bone back down. At the same time, guys, parathyroid hormone's talking to the kidneys, and it's telling the kidneys to prevent the loss of calcium, to hold on to every bit of calcium that comes through the kidneys. It also increases renal production of calcicitrol. Calcicitrol is the activated form of vitamin D. The last thing parathyroid hormone's going to talk to you is the intestines. This is going to tell the intestines to increase its absorption of dietary calcium. So when you do eat something or drink something that has calcium in it, this is going to allow it to be able to be absorbed quicker and taken to the appropriate area faster. This increases absorption of the dietary calcium. So in turn, it raises the blood calcium levels. All right, next we're going to look at the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are really important in the regulation of your sodium and potassium levels in your body, as well as your metabolism. They're going to help the body to resist stress as well. So they're going to play a role in that sympathetic nervous system, kind of fight or flight system. They also are an anti-inflammatory in their function. One adrenal gland is located on the top of each kidney. They look like little party hats you can see here on top of each kidney. The adrenal gland has two kind of structures to it. The outer layer of tissue on the adrenal gland is called the outer adrenal cortex, and it is responsible for secreting two specific hormones, aldosterone and cortisol. On the other hand, the inner part of the adrenal glands is called the inner adrenal medulla, and it secretes also two hormones known as epinephrine and norepinephrine. So let's talk about the cortex hormones first. So let's look at aldosterone. Aldosterone is also known as a mineral corticoid type of hormone because it's going to help regulate sodium and potassium, which are considered minerals. Aldosterone increases our sodium reabsorption, so holding on to sodium, which in turn causes our body to lose the potassium. This is going to be seen in the renal tubules. So when we look at aldosterone, it's going to communicate or talk to the kidneys. This helps regulate our sodium and potassium levels in our body. Now the way this works, guys, is it's a very convoluted type of pathway that aldosterone has to take. And it's going to start with what we call the renin-angiotensin pathway. This is when our total blood volume, our TBV, starts to decrease. This decrease could be due to hemorrhaging or even dehydration. The blood pressure also starts to decrease because of this. What notices that there's a decrease in this blood pressure and the amount of blood coming through are what we call the juxtoglomular cells. These cells are special cells inside of the kidneys and they contain special stretch receptors. They're going to detect when low blood pressure happens because they're not being stretched very much. They have less stress happening, stretch happening on them. So anytime this blood pressure drops to a certain point, these juxtoglomular cells secrete the enzyme called renin into the blood. Renin is then going to convert a plasma protein called angiotensin into angiotensin 1. So when we look at renin, renin kind of acts like it's an enzyme. It's going to take in the angiotensin and it's going to convert it, change it into angiotensin 1. 
Now this angiotensin 1 is then circulating through the blood and when this blood reaches the lungs, there's another enzyme called ACE, called the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE for short, is gonna convert it from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is then what tells the adrenal cortex to actually secrete the aldosterone. So you'll notice there's lots of steps that are happening, but if you'll notice too, the hypothalamus is not part of this, the pituitary gland is not part of this. It's the kidneys detecting an issue and then sending the signal in a kind of roundabout way to the adrenal glands. As more sodium, so this whole point though is it's gonna increase the sodium reabsorption this is gonna make the potassium excretion increase by the kidneys. As more sodium is reabsorbed or held onto by the body, more water will be absorbed. Guys, water is really attracted to sodium. So if sodium stays, water wants to stay. And that's why when we have salt in our diets, a lot of times it can cause our blood pressure to rise or it can also cause us to retain a lot of fluid for some individuals um, because water really likes the sodium. This process though of holding onto the sodium and thus the water is gonna increase the total blood volume. It'll then raise the blood pressure back to normal. Angiotensin II also causes vasoconstrictions of your arterioles so that small arteries are gonna be able to constrict which also helps raise blood pressure. But that's more of a short term fix whereas the other of holding onto the sodium and all that is gonna help with a more long term fix until they can tell the problem of either the hemorrhaging or the dehydration can be addressed. Now what happens if you have too much aldosterone, excessive amounts of aldosterone? This is known as aldosterism. This leads to excessive sodium reabsorption. It then in turn causes water retention and then it causes hypertension or high blood pressure. Frequently it's also going to cause what we call hypokalemia which, which is low blood potassium levels. This, when our potassium gets too low, it can cause muscle weakness and ultimately paralysis. Addison's disease is the opposite where there's a deficiency in aldosterone. A lot of times this is also going to be a deficiency in the other adrenal cortex hormone of cortisol as well. The adrenal cortex is not responding and so because of that it's not producing enough of AD, sorry, it's not producing enough of aldosterone or cortisol. This leads to renal loss of sodium, low blood pressure, mental lethargy, anorexia, muscle weakness, hypoglycemia, and the list can go on. There's a lot of factors that are being influenced by the lack of aldosterone and cortisol. So let's take a look at this flow chart when we're talking about aldosterone. So we see that we have low blood sodium levels or also low blood pressure or low total blood volume. This is going to trigger that renin pathway. So renin's release, which converts angiotensin to angiotensin 1, that travels to the lungs, which then ACE is going to convert it into angiotensin 2. This then talks to the adrenal cortex. It tells the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. This aldosterone is going to go talk to the distal convoluted tubules in the kidneys. So aldosterone is released, sending it to the distal convoluted tubules in the kidneys. This increases the reabsorption of sodium. It raises the sodium levels, which then in turn retains water, raising the total blood volume and the blood pressure. However, an indirect kind of consequence of this pathway is we are gonna end up losing the potassium. So we'll have a lower blood potassium level which we need to be careful of. So this is what we're looking at for aldosterone and that renin pathway. Now guys, here's a picture form that's just showing you again what can happen. We have dehydration, sodium deficiency or hemorrhage. There's a decrease in the blood volume. This decrease causes blood pressure issues. The juxtoglomular cells in the kidneys detect this. They increase their release of renin. This then converts angiotensin into angiotensin 1, which goes to the lungs. Once at the lungs, it changes angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. 
This then causes vasoconstriction. It is going to talk to the adrenal cortex, causing the release of aldosterone. So this is just showing the exact same thing we talked about, but it's just in a little different flowchart form. So now let's talk a little bit about the glucocorticoids. These are the cortisol hormone that is released by the cortex. Now the glucocorticoids is involved in the hypothematic pituitary adrenal axis or called the HPA. This is where we see the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland and the adrenal glands all working together. So this is multiple parts of the endocrine system working together. Cortisol is involved in metabolism. It will raise your blood glucose. It's also going to help your body resist stress. It raises up your blood pressure, but it helps your body resist stress. And it's also the part that makes it an anti-inflammatory. Cortisol is regulated by the corticotropic releasing hormone. This is released by the hypothalamus. So cortico releasing, corticotropic releasing hormone. This then is going to allow the ACTH, known as the adrenocorticotropic hormone, to be released from the anterior pituitary. This adrenocorticotropic hormone is going to tell the adrenal cortex to then secrete cortisol. Now, cortisol, guys, a lot of times is named as the stress hormone. Your body releases it a lot of times when your body is stressed. It's to help you be able to resist the bad things that potentially would happen with stress. Now, Addison's disease is where you have an under secretion of both aldosterone and cortisol. So we have a deficiency that's happening. On the other hand, Cushing syndrome is where we have an overproduction of ACTH. This leads to an overproduction of cortisol, which causes symptoms like skinny arms and legs, a moon type shaped face, buffalo hump, hyperglycemia, decreased immunity, and so on. So let's look at this flow chart for cortisol. I have low blood cortisol levels. This is detected by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then releases corticotropic releasing hormone. This talks to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary releases adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. This ACTH goes and talks to the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is then going to release the cortisol, or what we call the glucocorticoids. This cortisol is going to increase blood glucose. It's also going to help increase blood pressure to resist stress. And it's an anti-inflammatory by decreasing the immune response. But guys, this is one of the reasons that when we're really stressed out, like our body is dealing with stress a lot, we tend to get sick a little more often. And this is because cortisol is going to help kind of depress your immune system. And so it causes you to potentially catch, illness, catch a sickness or illness a little easier. Now, when we talk about a under secretion of aldosterone and cortisol, this is called Addison's disease. And guys, President Kennedy had Addison's disease. Um, we see that it was not something talked about too much, but he was being treated for that. Okay, um, his skin tone that looked kind of tan and all was due a lot of a lot of that was due to the Addison's disease that he had. In this picture, we see an individual who has Cushing syndrome, which is an over secretion of ACTH. This is kind of showing you the moon shape that you see, as well as a little bit of those bulging eye. Your eyes start to bulge a little bit with this type. All right, now let's talk about the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is the deep center of the adrenal glands, and it contains what we call chromaffin cells. These chromaffin cells are directly innervated by your autonomic nervous system. Okay, so this is going to be where there's a direct connection to the nervous system here. Adrenal medulla hormones are going to get secreted anytime the body is stressed. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are these two types of hormones, and they're also known as um, adrenaline and noradrenaline. The medulla secretes mostly epinephrine, about 80% of what it secretes is epinephrine, and the smaller amount of norepinephrine is about 20%. Both epinephrine and norepinephrine are unique because they cause the same effect as what the 
sympathetic nervous system does for the autonomic nervous system. They are going to help maintain the fight or flight type of situation. Now remember, since these are hormones, they're going to be able to maintain it for a longer period of time than what the nervous system is going to be able to do. Now epinephrine and norepinephrine also help the body to resist stress. Um, they can help increase heart rate, respirations, blood pressure, glucose, and cause vasoconstriction okay for your blood vessels but also bronchiodilation for your lungs all right so they can have lots of different roles when it comes to stress we also see that there's what we call a phochromocytoma this is a tumor or on the adrenal medulla or in the adrenal medulla and it causes fatigue very rapid heart rate and weakness due to the fact of how it it affects the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So let's look at this particular flow chart. We start with stress. Stress is gonna trigger the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. This sends impulses directly to the adrenal medulla, those chromaffin cells, okay? Actually, these cells a lot of times are called sympathetic postganglionic cells because they're at the very end of this sympathetic autonomic nervous system. This causes the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now remember, most of it is epinephrine at 80%. This is going to be where it mimics the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so this is the symphalomimetric. This is going to be where it's imitating or mimicking the fight or flight response because of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So because of this, this whole process is to try to help your body resist the stress, being able to handle the stress during that time. All right, so this is where we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the smaller glands. Um, the penile gland is attached to the roof of the third ventricle of the brain. We've already talked about this gland. We talked about the brain chapter. Um, the penile gland does secrete a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is going to help regulate your diurnal rhythms. Okay, when melatonin increases in your brain, it makes you sleepy. Melatonin also regulates seasonal breeding patterns in some animals, not us, but in some animals. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of daylight present. Since it might get darker sooner or stay lighter longer, this changes their seasonal breeding. It lets them know whether it's time to breed or not. Melatonin is regulated by visual detection of light. So light actually inhibits the release or production of melatonin. Light waves this is also why light helps wake us up. Seasonal affective disorder, also known as sad guys, is called winter depression. And a lot of times we're going to treat this with light therapy because these individuals are producing too much melatonin and it's starting to affect the brain. The next area we're going to look at are the testes. The testes are two oval glands and they are located in the scrotum region outside of the body. These are involved, of course, in sperm production. This is going to be what we call the male gonads. They also release the male, they also are responsible for the male sex characteristics, bone growth, and protein anabolism. And they do this by what hormones they release. So the interstitial cells, also known as Langdon cells, are going to secrete the hormone testosterone. Testosterone secreted when luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary stimulates these Langdon cells. This luteinizing hormone is secreted when gonadotropic releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus. Testosterone then stimulates sperm production, but it also causes the male sex characteristics like the deepening of the voice, facial hair, and thicker bones. The spermatogenic cells are the cells which develop into mature sp uh, spermazoa. These are going to be the ones that ultimately become the sperm themselves. These cells are stimulated to mature by follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, that is also released from the anterior pituitary. There's also some serotoli cells or nurse cells that are located in the testes and they're going to secrete inhibin. This hormone inhibin tells the anterior pituitary to not secrete any more FSH and this helps regulate sperm production. Now guys, if you'll notice these particular hormones like testosterone, um, 
the LH, FSH, those are all going to start being released in greater amounts by the body when puberty takes place. Now let's look at the female side. The ovaries are very similar to the structure of the testes, except for they're located in the pelvic cavity, and there's one on each side of the uterus. These are involved in the egg production, as well as helping the female with her secondary sex characteristics, the reproductive cycle, pregnancy, milk production, and delivery. So if we look at this, these ovaries have a few more jobs than what we saw in the male. But again, follicle stimulating hormone is going to be released from the anterior pituitary and it's going to talk to the ovaries to produce the follicles or eggs, allowing them to mature. This is then going to cause the ovaries to secrete estrogen. Luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary has the following functions on ovaries. It tells the follicles to mature. It actually causes the process of ovulation where the follicle ruptures and releases the egg. It also is going to tell the ovaries to secrete more estrogen and progesterone. Estrogens are involved in the female reproductive cycle, but estrogens also cause the sex characteristics, like a higher voice, a lack of facial hair, and female distribution of body fat. Progesterone, on the other hand, prepares the endometrium and the mammary glands for pregnancy. It inhibits uterine contractions during pregnancy, and it tells the anterior pituitary not to secrete any more LH or FSH because pregnancy has already taken place. Okay, the uterus or womb is full. We don't need to add necessarily to that. Now, LH and FSH are secreted in response to the gonadotropic releasing hormone that's going to be released from the hypothalamus. Ovaries can also secrete relaxin and inhibit. Relaxin is a hormone that softens the pubic symphysis. So the pubic symphysis, guys, is the cartilage that's between the two pubic bones at the front of your pelvic girdle. This is also going to loosen up and be able to spread a little bit for the child birthing process. The uterine cervix is going to get dilated by relaxin for delivery. Inhibit, on the other hand, tells the anterior pituitary not to secrete any more FSH. All right, moving on to the pancreas. The pancreas helps to regulate blood glucose levels. It's also going to be helpful in digestion, but we see that it's located posterior and slightly inferior to your stomach. So it's back behind and a little bit below your stomach. There are four types of endocrine cells that are clustered together in the pancreas into these areas called the isolates of Langerhans. In this structure, you're going to see that we have alpha cells. Alpha cells are going to secrete glucagon. When blood glucose levels start to get too low, it releases this glucagon in order to raise the levels back up into their normal range. On the other hand, beta cells are going to secrete insulin. Insulin is going to do the opposite of glucagon. When the blood glucose is too high, it's going to release insulin in order to bring the blood glucose back down to normal. There's also delta cells. Those are going to secrete somatostatin. This is a growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So it's going to help inhibit the growth hormone. We also see F cells. They're going to secrete pancreatic polypeptides. Also the parts that help make up pancreatic juice in a sense, which is involved in digestion. And we'll talk more about that in the digestive system. Now, what is a problem that we hear a lot of times with the pancreas, especially about the hormone insulin? Well, we call it diabetes. This is diabetes mellitus. It's a deficiency in insulin, and it causes hyperglycemia, so high blood glucose levels. This also causes glycosuria, which means that sugar is normally in the urine. It also causes polyuria, where they end up having to pee a lot and excessive thirst. And so guys, when we look at this, it's all of those kind of cardinal signs that we see for diabetes. Hyperinsulinism is when there's an overproduction of insulin. So this is the opposite of diabetes mellitus and it causes hypoglycemia. It also will cause things like tremors and sweating. So let's take a look at the flow chart here. We have low blood glucose levels. This is going to be where the pancreas detects this and the alpha cells are triggered in order to release glucagon. 
glucagon then is going to tell the liver cells to release extra glycogen stores that it has. This is going to raise the blood glucose level. It also tells the liver cells to convert lactic acid, which is a byproduct of um, using your muscles without oxygen. And it's gonna help them be able to take those amino acids and convert them into glucose. Okay, and so this is what the glucagon is gonna help do. On the other hand, when we have the high blood pressure, the high, sorry, on the other hand, when we have the high blood glucose levels, the pancreas is going to have the beta cells detect this. The beta cells then are gonna release insulin. Insulin is gonna help glucose enter into most body cells. So guys, most body cells have a receptor for insulin. It also tells the liver to convert glucose into glycogen. It tells liver cells to speed up protein synthesis and adipose cells to speed up what we call lipogenesis, which is the storage of the fat. Now let's briefly look at some of the endocrine tissues. We have the thymus gland. It's located in the mediastinum, which is in the middle of your chest with your heart, and it secretes several hormones related mostly to your immune system. The GI tract can also secrete several hormones, but they are related to digestion. The placenta, now this is a temporary organ that is present just during pregnancy, but it does secrete a particular hormone called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This helps maintain the pregnancy. This hormone helps the woman's body be able to help maintain the pregnancy. So it's also going to help secrete estrogen and progesterone because the pregnancy needs to have certain levels of estrogen and progesterone in order for it to be maintained. These hormones also help prepare the mammary glands for milk production. The kidneys are another one that can produce hormones. They can secrete EPO, which is erythropoietin. This is going to be a hormone that tells your bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. We also see that it can secrete what we call calcicitrol. This is the activated form of vitamin D. And vitamin D, when it's activated, helps regulate blood calcium levels. The skin also produces inactive forms of vitamin D in the presence of sunlight, but they have to be activated in the kidneys. The atria of the heart can also produce a specific hormone. This is called ANP or atrial natriuretic peptide. This particular um, hormone is going to help lower blood pressure when it gets too high. So guys, here is a chart that kind of shows you the organ, the major hormone, and the effects. And it's showing you a lot of these areas where we actually see it's more just a set of tissues that's producing this, not that that organ is completely part of the endocrine system. So you can take a look at these. So guys, this brings us to the whole idea of stress. Your body, when it's stressed, is going to rely on your nervous system and your endocrine system to help you survive. This is known as your general adaptation syndrome. Now, there are a number of different things that can trigger this syndrome, and these are known as stressors. Stressors can be good or bad, but here we're looking at most of the bad ones. So if you are really hot or really cold, that's a stress to the body. Surgical procedures, blood loss, poison, infection, fever, and even strong emotional responses. But guys, not all stressors are bad. Some of them stretch you and they challenge you, but they're not bad or detrimental to your health. Others, on the other hand, are. So when we look at the general adaptation syndrome, we see that there are a couple of steps that take place. The first is called the alarm reaction or the alarm step. This is the immediate set of, of response to a stressor. This is triggered by that fight or flight. We then see step two is the resistance reaction. This is slower to start, but it affects the effects last a whole lot longer. Okay, it's where those hormones are releasing what they're supposed to and trying to calm everything back down. General adaptation syndrome usually ends here because homeostasis is reestablished. But if homeostasis is not reestablished, we see if it, stress continues, your body will enter into the exhaustion phase. This is an increased catabolism, may lead to loss of potassium, depletion of cortisol, weakened organs, 
Um, and that can happen from all of the above types of reactions. Now, whether you enter the exhaustion phase depends on your general state of health before the stress began. All right, if you don't have very good general health before it began, it could affect you a lot greater than somebody who did have good, um, pretty much state of health. So guys, stress and disease. Stress can lead to a lot of different diseases. You'll notice a lot of the diseases listed here are gonna be things that cause inflammation. So we have gastritis, peptic ulcers, ulcerative colitis, that's in the colon, irritable bowel syndrome, hypertension, migraine headaches, anxiety and depression, asthma, and autoimmune disorders such as rheumatoid arthritis, RA. Now people under stress, are at a higher risk of also developing chronic diseases and even undergoing premature death. So it's super important that yes, we're all gonna have stress, but we should learn how to deal with it properly in order to help with our health and our future self. Now guys, in your book, you have this area that says disorders of, this is from the OpenStax book. You need to take a look at these. Also, several of these we talked about in the lecture itself, such as like seasonal affective disorder. We talked a little bit about pu pu pituitary dwarfism, gigantism. We talked about the different types of diabetes. And so a lot of these were discussed within the lecture as well. But take a look at the disorders of through your textbook. Now guys, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask.